Welcome back to Fear Genics, where we don't just watch movies, we devour them. I'm Kelton. And I'm Alex. And using our industry knowledge, we'll tell you everything you need to know about horror cinema, from classic to contemporary. Today, we're talking about The Blair Witch Project, a late 90s film released in 1999, directed by Eduardo Sanchez and Daniel Myrick. Couple of guys fresh out of film school. Nothing, nothing to do but fire from the hip. This movie, for a long time, I've known has been being a blind spot in my sort of horror movie catalog. Yeah. Um, I thought it would be too scary for me for a long time. And also, I've heard very mixed things about this, so mm-hmm. I was a bit skeptical to watch it. And uh, I ended up throwing it on for uh, Halloween, Halloween weekend. And I loved it. Yeah. It's, it's a quintessential found footage horror movie. I mean, I, I saw it when I was a little kid. And it scared the shit out of me because, you know, I was young and naive. So I was like, you know, this is real. Like these people actually went out in the woods. Um, it wasn't until later I watched it again and I realized it was kind of goofy. But, uh, you, know, you know, like what it did for the genre of found footage um, really speaks volumes. And it was very successful. Uh, you know, it was literally the most, the highest grossing independent film uh, until 2002 when my big fat Greek wedding knocked it off. <laughs> but it was a very successful film for two guys that, you know, were kind of just shooting for the stars. Yeah. And you weren't the only one as a kid who thought this was like real. Like they did this very intentionally sort of muddied the waters on was this real? Was this not? It being the first of its kind. A lot of people fell for it. Yeah, almost to a ridiculous degree, uh, something that wouldn't probably exist now. Like the co-directors would actively tell people that the actors were deceased. They On IMDb, if the actors were quoted as being deceased, they wouldn't get corrected by the co-directors. And Heather Donahue, the main, uh, the main lead, her mother ended up getting sympathy cards sent to her, uh, you know, sending her their condolences. And it's just like, you know, insane to me that these three people were just walking around and this movie was huge, you know, literally coast to coast. Everyone was watching this movie and everyone just thought these three random people were dead. Blows my mind. It's great. It's like a great gimmick, especially for an indie film to like get noticed. So this movie is very straightforward in terms of plot. Essentially, a group of three documentary filmmakers a host, a camera guy, and an audio guy go into the woods to try and explore um, or try to find out if the Blair Witch legends are true. Essentially, there's this legend in the area. What was the name of the town? Uh, Burkittsville. Burkittsville. Burkittsville, Maryland. That there was a witch in the hills who basically steals children and kills them. And... One of the uh, interesting details of the story is she makes the children turn away from the per- kid that's being killed, so they don't, s- so that the witch doesn't have to look them in the eyes while they're being killed. Mm-hmm. And that actually ends up being a kind of a thing on the last scene, um, when the the steering in the corner. Mm-hmm. It, it was a really nice callback. Like as the viewer, you knew exactly what was happening and that the kids were fucked. Yeah. It, while this was a very simple movie. Uh, It was very cohesive as a result of being so simple. There was like basically one main theme, you know, the Blair Witch is scary and it's haunting the woods or whatever. So there wasn't a lot to get confused by. Yeah. So, uh, sorry, we got a little bit ahead of ourselves talking about the last scene before we describe where the movie's going. But essentially these three filmmakers, they go out, they interview some people from the town, and then they set off into the woods themselves to try and find uh, a graveyard and sort of the house where the Blair Witch um, does her murders. Uh, fun fact, that cemetery is the only place actually in Burkittsville, Maryland. Everywhere else is just in the woods. Huh. They that never, makes sense. They just like got the sign and shot in the cemetery. And then they're like, that's good. We're good with Burkittsville. Yeah, I just assumed it would be on location. But I guess there's just woods everywhere. They could really just do it anywhere. I think it was a national park. Uh, yeah, Seneca Creek State Park in Maryland was primarily where it was shot at. Hmm. Is that where they were from? Uh, I think so. Um, it's actually called the Blair Witch, 
based off of Blair High School, where Eduardo Sanchez, one of the co-directors, sisters went to. Oh. Really, like, I don't know why it was important, but... It's a good name. Yeah. So the documentary filmmakers, they go into the woods, they get lost, and things start happening at night. They hear strange sounds as they camp. Sounds like people are running around or speaking in the woods. Uh, children. Sounds of children playing. Yeah. Uh, there's actually a scream, too. And uh, <laughs> crazy thing, that scream is recorded from the final scene. Mike screaming. Oh. And they, and they use that, that. They recorded the final scene first. And then they use that scream to uh, torture them. Nice. What do you mean by torture them? They, they just would play sound, like scary sounds on boom boxes while they were sleeping in the tent. They would like uh, the children playing. That was Eduardo's neighbor. And they recorded all the kids playing and they would just play that. At one point, they shook the tent while they were playing the children playing, you know, noises. And Mike described that as being the single scariest moment of the entire movie was whenever that happened. Because like, he'd just woken up and tent shaking, just children playing. Like, what's going on? Yeah. Okay. So that happens on the second night. Essentially, the plot of the movie is these kids go out into the forest, they get lost. And they progressively spend more and more nights in the forest as things get weirder and weirder. Each Essentially, night. the movie is nothing but three kids going in the woods and getting fucked with every single night until <laughs> they end up dying. And it's so simple, but the dread that you see in the actors' faces as night falls each day, like. They, they, each morning they're like so rough but they're like ready to like try and get out of the forest and as the day goes on they just like start to like lose it a little bit more mm -hmm. because they get closer and closer to nighttime when they know that they're gonna get fucked with yeah and, and what's crazy is the reason why their performance is so good because i mean these are just as far as we're concerned these are three regular people two of them don't even act anymore uh heather She's a medical marijuana grower now. And Mike, I think he's like a... He was a furniture mover for the Conan show. Um, and I'm pretty sure... Actually, no, Josh. Josh was the furniture mover. I think Mike is the only one actually still acting. It sounds kind of cool to work for Conan, though. Yeah. So just to sort of wrap up the plot, they eventually find a house. Or they lose their friend along the way. And he is screaming each night and they keep on trying to find him. And on the last day they hear him screaming and they follow the screams and they end up at a house. It's like a dilapidated rural farmhouse. There's like handprints on the wall of like small children. Oh yeah. Yeah. It's like muddy handprints. Yeah. It's, it reminded me of like a death stranding almost. Yeah. Just all up the staircase and they're exploring this house and like, you know they're going to get murdered. You don't go into a house like this and not get murdered. And they hear the screams. First they hear them upstairs, and they hear them downstairs in the basement. They go into the basement. And the camera work, we haven't described the camera work. All the shots are handheld from the point of view of the directors, as if this is found footage. So you can see one of the cameras drop, because they have two cameras. Yeah. One camera drops, and you don't know what happened to that character. And the other character lagging slightly behind them comes down and you just see yeah heather's heather's coming over, down after after mike falls sees mike with his uh face to the wall and you know that means heather is about to get murdered and then you see heather's yeah, camera then drop. that camera drops the thing that's interesting with this movie that's not so common with other found footage movies is that this was actually shot by the actors themselves 90 percent of this film was shot by the actors and i, I honestly think curious it, about that yeah and i honestly think it made it a lot better it made it a lot more raw like these weren't actual camera guys um heather she whenever she recorded that famous scene that they used in the cover of her crying and apologizing and her face was framed to where it was like the top half of her face she did that on accident she actually thought her whole face was in frame but you know, not being a camera operator, she held it too close and it ended up looking, you know, really like, I don't know. I think it helped it. It made it like kind of feel uncomfortable 
you know how she was just all flimmy and the camera's like right in her face yeah it felt very raw and the cameras themselves are like not the most amazing cameras ever they're like like 80s news cameras uh like a it was called a cp16 yeah they had one that was like sort of it felt like a like consumer home camera yeah like the camcorder and then they had a film camera that they had for story purposes like in story they wanted to catch supernatural stuff on film because that's like the real deal if you can get it on film yeah so that's why they had two cameras that scene where she's holding the camera at her face and sort of doing the crying confessional i was when i was watching that i was thinking i was thinking of the poster and you can see the top of her head in the poster and i was like where did that frame come from they must have gone back and reshot that scene. Yeah, like had an alt take that was her whole face. Yeah. Yeah. The scene where she's running through the woods. Um, oh, yeah. Like, the, like when she's running in the darkness. They had to shoot that twice. Why? So I wouldn't... Uh, just like logistical problems, I think like they probably just missed it or something. They never said exactly why, but they shot that twice. So I'm, I'm sure they shot other stuff a few times. I saw a Reddit thread about that. Well, about Blair Witch... Uh, project but that scene in particular they actually had a quote-unquote monster that they were supposed to show on camera the witch itself but she just missed the shot and maybe that's why they reshot it Um, but apparently they ended up liking the take where you don't see the monster better and that's the one they used oh is that the one where uh where they say what the fuck yeah so do you know what they were responding to whenever so i think it's the art director the art director is off screen in like stockings and wearing like pantyhose on his head Mm -hmm. and he's just running on the side of like to to their side and they turn and just go what the fuck (laughs) and they just like keep going that was supposed to be on camera oh okay and that's the shot they missed yeah okay that I mean, it probably would have looked pretty goofy from the sounds of it. Yeah, and, like, this movie is so much about, like... What you don't see. Yeah, like, it's the sound, it's... It's the atmosphere that the movie creates that makes it so scary. There's nothing visually scary about the movie itself. No, it... I think this is maybe why the movie, like, maybe doesn't hold up on multiple watch-throughs. But on the first watch-through, you're just there. You have no clue what's going on. And the movie refuses to reveal itself in any way. It's mostly it's mostly tension, like keeping you on the edge of your seat the entire time. And, you know, once the movie ends, it's like all that tension's gone. And watching it back, it's like, oh, the story is three people go to the woods and they die. There's not a whole lot to take away from it. But, you know, in the experience during the ride, it's so much fun. It is a little bit of a horrifying movie in the sense that you know these characters die from the beginning yeah like you see at the beginning of the movie they say something like this footage was found in the middle of the woods we never found these people and you kind of forget about it but midway through the movie i started to remember that like oh yeah there's no these people never get better like every night gets worse for them yeah and it's never gonna get better they die for sure and it's honestly beautiful how uh, this movie was produced. A lot of work went into the pre-production and and doing things, you know, during production to keep the movie feeling real and authentic. The shoot was eight days. It was an eight-day shoot, and they only got paid a grand a day, each of the actors. And they survived off of power bars and fruit. I think it was mostly bananas. And towards the last two days, all they got to eat for the day was one banana and one power bar and some water. That's such a like wild thing to agree to as an actor. I think they were, you know, young actors and actresses. Yeah, I forget. Just, Everybody here is like right out of college. Yeah. Like really trying to like prove themselves. These are a bunch of young people that are just like going for it and trying to make something cool as fuck. And they did. And Heather, it was actually supposed to be three male leads. But Heather's audition was so good and blew them away that they wrote it to have her be the main lead and then them be her assistants, essentially, um, which is super cool. While I'm on the topic, I should talk about the audition process. It's pretty insane. So they put an ad in Backstage Magazine 
uh, looking for three actors. Is that like an old film magazine? Yeah, I think so. I, I didn't look it up, but I think it's just some, some film mag. They put an ad in saying they're shooting a movie in a wooded location and it's going to be hell and you probably shouldn't apply. And the audition process, the way it worked is as soon as they walked in, the co-directors would tell them, you've been in jail for 10 years of a 25-year sentence. We're the parole board. Why should we let you go? And if there was even a moment of hesitation, the audition was done and they rushed it out the door. So that tells you like where the starting point for this movie was. Like these were improv actors. These were actors that could think on their feet and go with the flow to create a cool moment. You know, thinking back, it's like that's why this movie is so successful. There was so much work put into the front end that you know, obviously they had good performances, but they did all the thinking so that the people just had to be in the woods and react and then they just documented it. It wasn't so much uh, giving lines to three actors and, and letting them do their performances. It's interesting how the editing process of this film must have been somewhat reminiscent of editing a documentary in the same way that the movie is presented. Because I imagine with this much improv, you just got hours and hours of footage of people acting scared as shit in the woods. It's funny you say that. So it was an eight day shoot. It took eight months to edit it. They're 19 hours of footage. Funnily enough, the longest take that they took was a 45 minute take of them in the hotel or in the motel room getting wasted. Like they were actually just wasted recording. And I really wish I could see the original clip because it's described as like, you get to see the, the real personalities of all these people on display. Mike and Heather are reading poetry. And I think Josh is kind of being like a loud asshole. It's just so cool. Like It's basically just three people making a movie with all this other thought put into it. It made me wonder uh, with the actors filming, you know, is the whole crew like running behind the actor the whole time? Like how mobile is this crew having to be? So they actually didn't interact very much at all. The main way that these actors were interacted with, the only time they interacted with them, it was kind of in the very beginning. Heather needed the guys to go investigate a noise and the guys didn't want to do it. And I think they needed to do it for the, for the shot or something. And they just were like scared and wouldn't do it. So they had to actually go in and be like, you know, just do it. Like we're here, we're, we're watching you guys. Like just do what you're supposed to do. And I think from then on, they were good. From that point on, they communicated with them with dead drops, basically. They, would, they gave them a GPS uh, tracker thing and would program points in there with a milk crate and it had their food for the day and little notes for each of them that gave them their character you know, progression, like what they were supposed to do. And they weren't supposed to share it with anyone else. Oh, I wonder if they, like, when they didn't know who lost the map, if that was part of it. Yeah. They actually didn't know who was the one who lost so the map. So, Mike was the one tasked with destroying the map. Like, he got, he read his little note for the day, and that was his task. And then he kicked it off while they weren't looking, and he thought they saw, but they didn't. And they were like, where's the map at? They, they, they were genuinely like, where is the map? We can't find it. And he just sat on the knowledge that he destroyed the map. You know, he played with that. It's really interesting how it's like pseudo real. I would have expected this to have been like more hands on. Uh, it's a lot of trust in your actors yeah. to just let them go. And like, you can't even, I presumably nobody was even able to like see what they shot. Like there was no dailies. Yeah. I mean, the fact that Heather's crying scene was filmed the way it was, that tells you right there, like they kind of just went with what they got. And apparently most of what they got was pretty good because they made a good movie. One thing I will touch on is the budget. It is, it is definitely worth talking about. So this was shot on $60,000, which um, you know is a shoestring budget. That is very small. And final box office, $248 million. That's crazy. For every dollar they spent filming, they made 11 grand. And this movie holds the Guinness Book of World Records record for best ratio of budget to box office. That's insane. I guess that kind of explains why, you know, I don't think the directors really went on to do a whole lot more work. They were probably set up. Yeah, they, they got a little cash grab 
from the sequel that had basically nothing to do with them. And then they talked about potentially making a prequel in the 1700s that was like, you know, setting up the Blair Witch. But I don't think that ever came to be. It would hard, it'd be hard for me to imagine any sort of franchise being successful here because half of the whole movie is the presentation, the handheld found documentary style presentation. And if you lose that, you can't really pull that gimmick multiple times. But once you lose that, it's not as special anymore. So telling like the prequel story, it has to be a really good story. It can't just like sort of live off of like any sort of camera gimmicks anymore, which yeah. it's hard to suss out whether this was a great story or if it was just the combination of presentation and story that made this great. Yeah. And I think if they made a prequel, I mean, what if it's shot in the 1700s, you can't have shaky handheld cameras, right? That's true, like yeah. you're already, they're already going to have to completely make a different movie. I guess if you want that, you can just watch The Witch. Yeah, The Vavitch. Fun fact, production actually concluded on Halloween night. Nice. They walked out of the woods, and uh, Mike described being in the woods for eight days and then walking out and seeing people in costumes is very surreal. And then they ate Denny's. Hell yeah. Some Halloween Denny's. Which one is Mike? He's the one that they don't kill. He's like, he makes it to the end. Okay, yeah. yeah. Josh disappears. So... Uh, I'll touch on that really quick. The script originally had Mike and Heather as former lovers. And during the trip, they were supposed to have sexual tension. But what actually ended up happening was Josh and Heather ended up, you know, actually getting along. Uh, And the co-directors didn't like it. It actually, it was an inconvenience to shooting the movie. So they killed Josh off. They rewrote it to have Josh die instead of Mike. So it should have been Josh standing in the corner at the end of the movie. But uh, I wonder if that explains why the audio guy starts to lose it and he starts to go crazy. And at some point he becomes sort of the like level headed one, the voice of reason. And I wonder if they like changed his character to not be so crazy. Maybe the craziness was part of him going to be being yeah. killed off initially. So I think when he kicked the map, I think that was like on the progression of him being killed off. And then, you know, they went to bed and that's when Josh disappeared. Funnily enough, when Josh disappeared, he was at a concert. He went and got Denny's and uh, went to a concert while they slept in the tent. That sounds great. And he still made his thousand bucks for the day. (laughs) And it's so unrealistic for the audio guy to lose it anyway. If you've ever been on a set, the audio guy is typically the most level-headed, cool as a cucumber yeah, guy. Yeah, I out mean, there. they are the most rock-solid, reliable thing you can have on set. And, you know, it just doesn't make any sense that he would lose his cool. Glad they changed that. So, now this one, this one's a little crazy. This one's going to come out of left field, but Bruce Willis may have called found footage movies being successful while on set of Pulp Fiction. You're going to need to elaborate a little bit for me. So it's 1992 and Bruce Willis is on set of Pulp Fiction, one of the best movies of all time. And Bruce Willis says, someday in the next five years, someone's going to take one of these, quoting found footage, and make a feature film with it. They almost did it with uh, Bob Roberts. Some kid, some 17-year-old kid, is going to make this killer, drop-dead, poorly lit video movie that's going to be the hippest fucking thing and then there's going to be hundreds of them everywhere and they're going to cost about $60,000 he called the exact budget of Blair Witch five years prior and the genre that's crazy did he ever go to produce anything like if I go look at the credits for like paranormal activity is he going to be like an executive producer maybe I mean, he might have been the the secret mastermind behind all these found footage films, as far as I'm concerned. He was the Blair Witch the whole time. (laughs) The Bruce Witch. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, this is on a little aside, but um, Heather Donahue, uh, she was pretty apprehensive about shooting this movie. Rightfully so, I think. You know, the idea, the notion of sleeping in the woods with two grown men for eight days didn't particularly thrill her. So she brought a knife on set uh, her first day. And one of her first questions was, 
is this a snuff film? That's very in character. Mm-hmm. And a good question. This is the 90s. The directors are obviously sort of like doing weird shit. Like this is a weird concept for how to film a movie too. I mean, they literally signed a waiver that gave the producers consent to quote mess with their heads. That was the actual verbiage on the contract. I mean, yeah. that, if that doesn't suss you out, then nothing can. So I referenced it a few times, but this movie had a massive impact on uh, the genre of found footage. I mean, it really wasn't much of a genre before Blair Witch. Cannibal Holocaust was was one of them, but it wasn't a huge, you know, mainstream success. So it didn't create a genre or anything. I haven't seen Cannibal Holocaust. That a that sounds like a scary movie. It's brutal. Uh, it's banned in a few countries. It's just like gratuitously grotesque. Uh, there's real animal death in it. Like they kill a turtle. They oh, like, yeah, I've they like murder a turtle on screen. Rightfully so. It's a very contentious film. But um, I think after Blair Witch, probably the most iconic found footage franchise would be Paranormal Activity. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I was going to say Cloverfield, but like modern day 2022, like Paranormal Activity is the franchise that people remember. Yeah, there's a ton of movies that copied off of Paranormal Activity, which I don't think you could say the same for Blair Witch. Yeah, I mean, Blair Witch, the particular sort of shaky cam style, like almost anything that uses that is sort of, you know, you can directly trace the lineage from Blair Witch. If you have a character holding a camera and it's shaking and framed badly, it's really hard to point your finger anywhere else. So Cloverfield, what was it Project X? Did you ever see that movie? Oh, yeah, Project X. That was a good one. It was like, I watched that in high school and it was just so goofy and stupid. But yeah, I feel like the genre has sort of evolved now and, you know, people are copying paranormal activity. Cloverfield's another good one. I love Cloverfield, actually. A, a, a lot of people didn't like Cloverfield. But I really I liked Cloverfield. it when it came out. Another movie that in retrospect is not as good on a second rewatch, but on the first one, it, I loved it. Yeah. I think this might have sort of opened the door for low budget movies on sort of the production side, because I think for a long time and still today when people go out and make a movie a big part of the budget is getting the nice gear you know a lot of filmmakers they have you know a thousand dollar two thousand dollar cameras that they just use daily for client work or for home shooting yeah and then when they film a movie they like want to rent the big nice cameras in the 90s you wanted to rent a film camera whereas personally you just had a digital camera yeah and the way this movie intermixed digital camera and film camera both of which quality like doesn't hold up today i think might have opened the door for people to not care so much about that stuff in order to tell a story because you know it's not hard to watch blair witch and see the digital zoom all over the place and grainy photos and like that doesn't really detract from the project it, it, and it makes it better almost it's almost like the raw authentic found footage nature of it lends to it being a better movie it's one it's like another case of like your footage can be garbage god awful but as long as the audio is good audiences won't mind when they thought about creating a movie it wasn't just about the gear necessarily if they knew they could get what they needed out of the actors out of the script then you can settle for you know a five thousand dollar camera and not have to worry about renting the twenty thousand dollar camera they actually took one of the cameras back after the movie concluded to stretch that budget a little bit further took it back to circuit city for 10 grand that's hilarious that they uh didn't even rent i I guess i don't know if renting equipment was around in the 90s i guess it probably was and uh the other camera mike's camera the um over the shoulder news black and white camera Mm -hmm. that one sold on ebay for 10 grand i'm surprised they owned their equipment i guess that's just how you did it in the 90s So overall, do you recommend The Blair Witch Project? Absolutely. The Blair Witch Project is a required viewing for anyone that loves horror movies. But if you want to take a dive into the found footage genre, honestly, it's top three. Like, if you want to see a found footage movie that's scary, watch Blair Witch Project. And I think if you have to pick one to watch, it should be Blair Witch Project just because of how impactful it was on the genre and really developing the genre. 
that said, Paranormal Activity is also pretty good. You should watch that. But I recommend this. I really enjoyed this movie. It was not as scary as I thought it would be. I'm going to just say no jump scares, which matters to people. It used to matter to me a whole lot. That would be like a deciding factor on whether or not I watched a movie. I've cooled off on that. I can handle some jump scares, I think, but I will let you know there is none. I think the trend of jump scares has died off a little bit. Like, this is an aside. I'm really glad it has. Like, it seems like in the 2012s, around that time, horror was just jump scares. Like, jump scares was a quintessential part of making a horror movie. And I think we finally moved out of that. They're still, they still exist, obviously. But jump scares suck. I mean, if you want to, if you want to scare me, show me something that makes me feel dread and, you know, cringe and pull back in my seat. Don't play a cheap stock audio effect and throw something on the screen suddenly. That's not scary. That's, that's cheap. Yeah. I don't think anybody comes away from a horror movie and thinks, damn, I loved that jump scare. That was the best part about nobody's the movie. ever said that. <laughs> So yes, two thumbs up from Feargenics. One one thumb from me, one thumb from you. Two thumbs up from Feargenics for Blair Witch. Two out of two. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you for joining us in our descent into madness. I'm Kelton. And I'm Alex. Be sure to check us out on Instagram and YouTube and Twitter and our website, feargenics.com. Have a good one. Take care. <laughs>